What's up guys, Evil Deer here and today I'm going to do another video on an interesting historical aspect of the Esperanto community. This time I'm going to be focusing on Omoto, which is a Japanese religion, and its links with Esperanto, the created language, or in this case, the language of heaven. I'll get into more detail about what that means later in the presentation. I got the vast majority of these materials from this book, Racontoi el Amoto, which basically translates as stories from Amoto. It's an excellent read, but only available in Esperanto. If you can read Esperanto, I highly recommend that you get this book. So I guess I need to first explain what is Amoto. So Amoto is a Japanese religion founded in 1892, which means it was founded about roughly the same time in history when Esperanto was created. Esperanto was uh, first published in 1887, so you can see they came around in the time in history when they were experiencing similar things. Now the name of Amoto translates to roughly great foundation or great source, something along those lines. It's not a massive religion, but it's still sizable to any extent. It's got 170,000 official members. And I think I read that there's about 200 people who work full time in different religious uh, organizations within the religion itself. And in fact, there's a fair few people who speak Esperanto and work within those organizations. You'll hear more about that later. It's a new religion, which is based on Shinto, but also on the writings of of the Gucci Nao. It's a kind of a single deity religion, but also not at the same time. So you gotta remember that Western religions and Eastern religions are quite different. So the idea of God in this religion is of one single thing, but it's made up of many different aspects. And these aspects are called kami or kami. And they basically are layered, but they all make up the same thing, even though they have their own personalities and whatnot. So you could say it's a single uh, deity religion, or you could say it's a multi deity religion. It's really just based on perspective. And it has a really unique history entwined with Esperanto, which is what got me interested in it in the first place. So the religion was founded by the Gucci Nao in 1892. Now, when she founded the religion, she was actually 55 years old and she didn't found the religion herself. So she had lived quite a miserable life. It was quite poor. She lost um, family members. Her husband died. And when she was 55 years old, she woke up one day possessed by a spirit and started prophesizing the end of the world and an eventual savior. She didn't say who the savior was and it's not really clarified, but that's what she started stating. Now she was illiterate. She couldn't write, she couldn't read, but in spite of this, she managed to write over 200,000 pages of prophecies, which is quite, quite amazing if you don't know how to read or write. Now she used a method which is called automatic writing. You've probably all seen it in the movies where like someone's possessed by spirit and they just, they're kind of just like writing away, but they're not really focused on what they're writing. They didn't write that. It's like the spirits using them to write it. And all of these writings were collected together and were put together into something called the Fudasaki. Now I'll go into detail about how that happened. So at this time when she was having these prophecies, she was basically searching out what was happening to her and she was going to all these different religious groups that were forming around her. This part of Japan at this time in history was like full of religious revival and religions, like new religions. There was basically a new religion in every town. She was trying to find out who could tell her what was happening. Eventually she joined several different groups but she realized she was just being, you know, taken for the run. They were just using her. And she decided uh, to create her own religion in a sense. Now it wasn't like she just woke up and went, I'm gonna create my own religion, but she started talking about her prophecies and a religion formed around her. Now this guy here, Onisaburo de Gucci, uh, he married her daughter and he started organizing all her writers, writings together into one set of scripture, which basically codified the religion. Now it wasn't called Omoto at this stage in history, it had a different name, as happens a lot of religions, and eventually it became Omoto. It was just like this small little group of individuals who came together and it kind of started growing from there. So an interesting aspect of this religion is that the spiritual leaders have generally been women. The only real exception to that is the previous guy because he played an important role in codifying the religion. But apart from him, the majority of leaders have been women. And as I stated, there's several levels to their belief in God. You've got your main God at the top, then you've got a God of heaven, a God of earth, and under that you've got kamis. And all of them are considered gods, but all of them are kind of separate, but at the same time, all kind of one. Now the kamis generally are like small spirits spiritual gods, like lesser gods. And it's interesting that a lot of the Kamis actually are spirits of historically important people, especially 
religious people. But one of the Kamis, which is where it gets interesting, is actually Zamenhof. So Zamenhof is considered a lesser god in this religion. So you're probably wondering how it got to that. And I guess we need to go through some of the uh, history of Omoto itself. So it started with persecution. It always starts with persecution. So there's one part of the Omoto belief system which basically the emperor didn't like. They believed that there was two origin original kami and they were driven out of Japan by the kami or the ancestors of the imperial line. So basically they were at odds with the emperor. You've got to remember at this time everyone believed that the emperor was God and they were saying that yes he's a god but he's not the original god. So that caused a lot of problems and obviously the secret police at that time got involved. Every nation had a secret police at that time. So in 1921 a lot of the followers of Omoto were arrested, their property was confiscated and their shrines were destroyed by the secret police and Onisaburo himself, he was briefly arrested, but they didn't go too hardcore. They basically just walked in, destroyed everything, and went, that'll teach you guys. Now, pray to the emperor. And it's exactly at this same time in history when Onisaburo was reading about and learning about Esperanto. He actually had heard about Esperanto because there was an Esperanto speaker who was a friend and a secretary of his. And he was becoming interested in Esperanto. And then there's a local course that kind of popped up at a university near him. And that was run by some Esperanto speakers who would come in from Tokyo because there was a big earthquake there at the time. And he really wanted to go to this course and learn about Esperanto, but he couldn't. He knew the secret police were watching him and if he went to some uh, course and learned about an international language, well, they would just think, well, he's definitely trying to spread his belief system outside the country and that's just bad. So instead, he sent a woman in his place, a young woman. Now, he did this because at that time in history, young women or just women in general weren't considered to be politically dangerous in any form. So he sent her there and the secret police completely ignored it. She learned Esperanto, came back, reported to him and she actually became a really important figure in the Omoto community. Ha <laughs> ha! Ah, screw you secret police. After that in 1925 when the emperor finally passed all this persecution basically came to an end because there was really no need for it anymore and I'm guessing that the follow-up emperor empress whoever was next in charge wasn't really interested in our motto so much at that time. You gotta remember this is now leading up to World War II and as a result comes the second incident and this was the worst of the two incidents. So in 1935 over 1,000 Aomoto leaders and founders were arrested and jailed and Onisaburo himself was, was put on trial and then imprisoned for six years. This persecution of Amoto followers continued until the end of World War II. So they're basically, they were completely shut down because the Japanese could not have a pacifist religion which was kind of against the emperor existing while they were at war with the rest of the world. Now the persecution ended after World War II and the government, the new Japanese government, actually offered to pay up all the damages for all, you know, all the stuff that was destroyed, property that was taken, people were arrested and jailed. But the followers of Omoto actually rejected this, saying that they didn't want to be a burden on the rebuilding of Japanese society. So you could see that they were really pacifist in this regard. So Omoto today is still primarily a Japanese religion. Now its religious texts are only available in Japanese, but some parts of them have been translated to Esperanto and to a lesser extent English. Uh, Zamenhof is seen as a lesser god within this religion and this is actually what they stated when they made him a lesser god. The spirit of Zamenhof even now continues to act as a missionary of the angelic kingdom. Therefore his spirit was deified in the Senrai Sha Shrine. Esperanto actually entered Japan very early during the history of Esperanto itself but it kind of died off after a little bit of time. Then in 1990 the Japanese Esperanto Institute was founded and they basically started promoting Esperanto in the newspapers and that's how Onisaburo heard about it. Now at the same time in history there was a lot of Baha'i uh, followers coming into Japan and promoting their religion through Esperanto and basically the two movements, Omoto and the Baha'i met each other using Esperanto and talked a lot. Now as you can see here it was uh, Haruko Kato who was secretary to Onisaburo who first learned Esperanto and then promoted it to Onisaburo and in 1923 after Onisaburo became interested uh, he started promoting it within the Omoto community and then 130 people took up the first course started learning Esperanto and after that 
more and more pe people who are followers of our model started taking up and learning Esperanto, just one course after another after another. And then this was at that time during the second persecution. Well, the secret police were starting to get a little bit afraid of this to the point where they started sending secret police, not like as secret police, but disguised to these courses to learn Esperanto to find out what the Omoto were interested in. So on the 24th of November 1923, Onisaburo basically declared after 10 years, all people, I'm doing a rough translation, which don't know how to speak Esperanto certainly will become left behind for this period of history. Now obviously that didn't happen right away but you know, maybe happen in the future and after that he subsequently declared that Esperanto is not just a language that all followers of our motto should learn, it's actually the language of heaven. And he stepped up religious efforts to spread Esperanto in Japan and internationally. So there's a speech that Onisaburo de Gucci gave, which sums up basically his beliefs regarding Esperanto. And I think it's a, an excellent little piece. It's only available in Esperanto, so if you can read Esperanto, you can just pause and read it, but I'm gonna give a summary in English. So basically he said, there are some board members and some members of the Omoto community who are kind of fighting for uh, the use of Japanese as opposed to Esperanto in spreading our motto around the world. And he basically replied saying, Japanese is not a language which has like some great hero like Napoleon who's gonna go around, conquer the world, and then spread Japanese. And even if that happened, that only a few people would actually learn Japanese. He said it would actually be better and more in line with the beliefs of our motto if we used a neutral language to spread our scripture, our word as they put it. So that's why he was promoting Esperanto. Now kind of to sum this up, uh, Esperanto still has a very important place in our motto. If anything, it's actually increased in importance. I have a friend who's traveled to Japan a few times and most of the Esperanto speakers he's met there are actually followers of our motto and he stayed in some of their um, institutions, some of their religious places. So this is a stone that was erected by some of the uh, motto uh, followers on the 14th of July 1963. 300 people attended the event presented by the third spiritual guide Nahoi Deguchi and it basically says one God, one world, one bridge language. So you can see that this is almost a core belief of our motto. Now I've reached the end of this video. Before I close up, I just wanted to ask you guys your opinion on these types of videos. If you like them, you don't like them, let me know in the comments. You can even propose ideas that I speak about. So that's it. If you like this video, like it, share it around, sub to the channel, and I'll see you all in the next video. And if you're not there, well, I hope you're reading this book.